Hey everyone, welcome to Things We Said Today, the Beatles podcast, where we discuss anything and everything having to do with the Beatles together and apart. I'm Darren DeVivo. Uh, some of you might know me from WFUV Radio, where I've been since 1984, uh, currently on the air four nights a week, late night, and on Saturday afternoons, and here with you on Things We Said Today, and my uh, co-hosts each and every other week are Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen. Now, you know Ken from all of the radio years of Beatles radio programs he's hosted, closing in on 40 of those, and currently the host of the syndicated show Every Little Thing. Uh, he's the co-host of the video cast Talk More Talk, which takes place at 9 o'clock on mon- Monday nights. And Ken will elaborate more on these a little later on in the show. And uh, Ken got his start back to before they even invented radio. Uh, he was broadcasting <laughs> and uh, started to make a name for himself with his Beatle radio shows, especially when he hit WDHA in northern New Jersey. And then years later, XM Radio. And thanks to the pandemic, his Every Little Thing radio show on WNHU has been suspended it's on a hiatus, but you do have the syndicated version that can be heard around the world. And Ken, it's great to have you on board once again. Thank you, Darren. Hi to everybody. Hi to you, Alan. And hey, hi Ken. to our special guest. <laughs> yes, we have a special guest today. Uh, but before we get to our guest, uh, our other co-host here on Things We Said Today, Alan Cozen. Uh, he was the New York Times classical music critic for some 38 odd years. What is the deal with the three of us in closing in on 40 years? Everything is almost 40 years. I'm on FUV almost 40 years. Is no. Is it that long? My goodness. Uh, and Alan, 38 years. Ken, 37, 38 years. Anyway, I digress. Alan Cozen, a longtime classical music critic for the New York Times. He's written a bunch of books, including The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop. And got that something how the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, changed everything. And you can still read Alan's work in the New York Times, in the Wall Street Journal, in a bunch of other places, and look for his book, which he's co-writing on Paul McCartney, coming in 2021. Alan Cozen, it's great to see you again, my friend. Hey, Darren, and hello, Ken, and hello, unnamed as yet special guest, and everyone else out there. (laughs) (laughs) Now, it, it is a thrill to get to interview this guy once again, somebody whose work I've admired for years, and I believe he was a guest of mine on WFUV on two occasions, possibly three. The brain cells don't work quite as well any longer. Uh, and I'm talking about author Ashley Kahn. Uh, Ashley's written some jazz Bibles, A Love Supreme, The Story of John Coltrane's Signature Album, uh, which was published in 2003, and I hope I have the years correct. The House That Train Built, the story of Impulse Records, which is essential reading for anyone who likes uh, modern jazz. That was published in 2006. Kind of Blue, the making of the Miles Davis masterpiece from tw- 2007, and most recently, uh, before the George Harrison book, it was uh, his work with Carlos Santana on Carlos's autobiography, The Universal Tone, bringing my story to light. Not my story, but Carlos Santana's story. Ashley Kahn assisted with Hal Miller on that book. And now we have uh, this new book on George Harrison. And it gives me great pleasure to end this 10-minute introduction by welcoming our special guest, Ashley Kahn. How are you, Ashley? I'm great. You're you're making me feel like I'm the Harry Lime of the show. (laughs) (laughs) There's so much much buildup, and then finally you meet me. Yeah. We have to say goodbye because we're out of time now. And I want to thank everyone for tuning in. <laughs> no, no, stop. Um, but uh, one more thing, uh, Ashley, also, I almost forgot this. Uh, Ashley has won a Grammy Award for the liner notes he wrote for the John Coltrane album, Offering, live at Temple University, which came out in 2014, of a 1966 performance of Coltrane's. He was nominated for other Grammys as well. And uh, once again, Ashley Kahn's on Things We Said Today. It's great to be here, guys. Thanks for having me. And before we talk with Ashley about George Harrison on George Harrison Interviews and Encounters, his new book, it's news time. And with all the news that we could fit 
it's Ken Michaels. All right, thank you, Darren. Uh, first of all, I mean, everybody knows about this <laughs> who's listening to the show. This is old news at this point, but it's exciting news as it was officially announced the release of McCartney 3 coming out December the 11th with so far as we know it, 11 tracks. In the reasons to pull your hair out, parts one through 10 <laughs> section of the show, on the subject of the McCartney 3 album, there are at least 10 physical variations of McCartney 3 for sale. And some, I've been told, have already sold out. You guys probably know more about this than I do. I think they um, mostly gonna... sold out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's the standard album. There's the opaque Coke bottle album from Spotify where uh, 1,500 copies were made and uh, that sold out. There's a green vinyl edition from Target. 1,500 copies were made, sold out. There's a blue vinyl from uh, HMV. Again, 1,500 copies. There is the yellow version, which is the first one I heard about from Third Man yeah. Records. They made 333 copies of this, and actually it's a combination of yellow vinyl and, um, what was it, black dots or black yeah. vinyl? Was, yeah, they combined the two, and it was actually taken from previous copies of McCartney and McCartney 2 <laughs> that they made together. Yeah. Um, it, they called it a, a regrind pressing, and they were hand-numbered, too. There was a pink vinyl version from Newbury Comics, 1,500 copies, a red vinyl one, another one from Third Man Records, 3,000 copies, I'm told, sold out, um, a white, uh, white vinyl version from an indie label, 2,000 copies, there's the standard CD, and then there's the Target CD, which has green cover art. Now, you guys are more into this than I am. I just care about getting the music. I'm going to want to buy whatever version has the most songs on it, whatever the super deluxe is. That's what I mainly care about. I don't really go hunting down all these different vinyl versions. Anything you guys want to say about this madness and what happened in the last week or so? I, do you want to, Alan? I have a number of thoughts. Yeah, the only thing I, I wanted to say was the one that you had said from an indie label really is for indie record stores. You know, for little. Okay. Little, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't tend to collect colored vinyl either. Um, and one of the problems with a thing like this is that if I um, if I get one, <laughs> I have to get them all. <laughs> and sadly, because of the way the ordering rolled out and what was available at the time, I've got I've ordered the standard black one and the CD, uh, the red one from Paul's page, his website. A friend in Europe asked me to try and get him um, several copies of the pink one, which I did, and I thought, well, while I'm here, I might as well get one of those. So I have, um, I think, three different vinyls, and I guess the big experiment is to see whether I can get through the rest of my life without having acquired the remaining seven. And I think I'll be able to do it because I have to save up for the um, roulette wheel, the giant roulette wheel <laughs> version that's going to have another 40 seconds of music and some prints. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you're joking or not. Is of course, yeah, I am. Okay, all right. But, you never it, know that, but it wouldn't surprise you, would it, if it came as a big roulette wheel? <laughs> Great minds work alike. Is that the saying? Great minds think alike. Mm. Because I was also thinking there's going to be a, like a casino, like a, a portable casino set uh, that's going to come out next year that's going to have the remainder of all of the tracks that Paul did with all kinds of colored dice. But you won't know what colored dice are inside what set you get. So you just got to buy a bunch of them and hope, you know, uh, you get all the different colored variation dice. My thoughts on this, uh, because I'm the type of person, this is right down 
the middle for me when it comes to collecting. I am a music collector. I don't tend to go for super rare, expensive memorabilia necessarily. I'm not the type of person that collects like figures or cars and things, you know, those type items, a Beatles Christmas ornaments. I love them all. I tend to concentrate on the music. And in a way, as excited as I was last week when we heard about the McCartney 3 album and all the different label variations, I was also infuriated because I'm thinking to myself, now I have to try to get them all. And in a perfect world, two copies of each, one to remain sealed, one to play. Yeah. But then I thought to myself, wait a minute, I'm not going to play all these different colored variations when all is said and done 99 percent of the time the cd will be what is you know playing or maybe the black vinyl but any in any event uh it all unfolded kind of strangely uh some could say it wasn't fair the way uh, all these editions came uh, were announced they seemed to be staggered out over the course of a day all of a sudden the rumor mill was saying there's a pink copy here there's the plaid copy there you can get the, uh, the you know, the, um, the, the rainbow colored vinyl here. And I was away from my computer for most of the day. And maybe that's a good thing. I was only able to get the, uh, the Spotify edition, which was a Coke bottle green. And also the white one, which seemed to me to be the one that was the easiest to get. The white vinyl, was, which was being sold by indie record stores. And I was able to order actually two copies from two different stores because I wasn't sure if my transaction went through on one of them. And uh, thanks to a, a Facebook friend and fellow Beatles fan, I probably have secured a blue one, which I'm assuming would be pretty rare because um, they were only pressed, I think, in the UK for HMV. And then, of course, the topic of the one, the Third Man Records, uh, the well, two of them, the Third Man Records printed, I guess you could say it was a standard red vinyl copy and then the crazy yellow one that you were talking about ken that mm -hmm. was pressed from ground up copies of mccartney and mccartney 2 which i would think would probably be an audio nightmare i can't imagine how that would sound good uh when you play it but the ever inventive and uh wild jack white and his company came up with that concept but i just don't like things like you know, I find out about the McCartney two out of the McCartney three album, and I'm all excited. And then, oh, by the way, there's a special pressing uh, that's sold out. I'm like, how could it possibly be sold out? I just woke up and found out about the album. Right. You know, and that's how the day went with all of these. So it's frustrating if you're a collector to not, uh, you know, be able to take advantage or at least have a choice. All right, I won't buy them all, but I'd love the red one. You can't get it; it's gone. Or you don't can't get them all, or some people got them all, maybe hoarded a bunch. And of course, when marketing like this takes place, people, some people are angry at feeling that McCartney's doing this just to, you know, take our money. Does he need all these colored vinyls? Boy, this is a cheap way of trying to ensure that McCartney three sells well and is a number one. You know, when in reality, I think that in the day and age we're in now. You've got to do something very unique, very exciting and gimmicky to sell records today. And that's all it was. So, you know, I was um, excited, a little frustrated, got a few colored vinyls. I don't anticipate being able to get any more. I'd love the pink one. I've bid on eBay. I've kept my bidding within reason and have been quickly shut out. I'm sure you guys have seen the... Um, uh, the few copies of the yellow vinyl one uh, selling for four, five, six thousand dollars on eBay. Yeah. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then, of course, there's the issue of the dice, which I think is a very cool promotional item to go with the album. The uh, McCartney three dice, which Ken didn't get, unfortunately. But Alan and I got and initially it was like, well, why didn't all three of us get uh, hmm. these promotional items? But I think it turns out that. If you purchase uh, either the Flaming Pie Mega Box, as I call it, or uh, the Egypt Station suitcase, I think you ended up on a mailing list. Uh, and, you know, our our thank you gift was getting these dice, which is a neat little promo item. They were items like this were more common back in the day. Record companies don't really do nifty little promo items like this any longer. So um, 
I found one pair on eBay selling for an astronomical amount of money. Um, so it all has us talking about McCartney three though. Yes. Yeah. The goal. See, I only spent four hundred dollars on the Flaming Pie box set, so I guess I didn't rate <laughs> the dice and the pouch there. <laughs> I'm surprised I didn't just send you the pouch empty. <laughs> <laughs> I would have been happy with that, yeah. but uh, yeah. It's, it's something. The only thing that ever bothers me about any of this, it's not so much the collector's items, but when the CD versions come out and then there's a deluxe version that follows and it's got two more songs or three more songs and then a super deluxe version out, just like with Egypt Station. Just tell yeah. me, just yeah. tell me which version has all the songs. Let me buy it. I don't want to buy the same album three, four times over. Just tell me how it's going to come, how all the songs are going to come out. They haven't even given you a track listing of all the eleven songs, right? You know, so you don't know how all this is going to play out. So um, eventually, I'm probably going to have to buy, you know, all the different versions that come out just to get every song. But yeah, that's that, that that's bothers me more than that. anything. Was he that? may not do that. I mean, there's no guarantee that every album he does now. It's going to be like what he did with Egypt Station, but maybe this time the main gimmick was the colored vinyl and these other tracks won't come out or might come out in another form at some point. We'll have to see. I'm surprised he didn't issue a single or whatever, you know, what, it, what, what is a single today? Right. Uh, seems whenever an album gets mentioned, uh, gets announced, there's a track that gets released and then another one comes shortly after that and, uh, you know, we now know for one week officially that McCartney 3 will happen December 11th, but we still haven't heard a single. Well, there's still plenty of time. They could easily drop one Paul, any day. So, Paul's quickly recording the album now as we speak. <laughs> All right. What we do know about this album is there's a song called When Winter Comes, which is from the same session as Calico Skies. So George Martin would get, uh, I guess, a co-production credit on there. Paul plays guitar on the song. And there is a song called Deep, Deep Feeling, which is over eight minutes long. Interesting thing about this album is that if you've uh, read the interview that Paul has given, and he, he gave an interview to BBC Radio 6, he's saying that he didn't know at the time that this would be his next album, which sounds just like what he said for the McCartney 2 album. And the McCartney and then 1 he album. Said, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, come on, <laughs> you know what you're doing as you're doing it. Um, but yeah, he did this during the, the, the quarantine and he was living with uh, his daughter Mary and his grandkids. And so he had a lot of time to kill. And there was a report, I don't know how accurate it is, that they said there's 25 songs that are supposed to come out. Maybe he recorded 25 in total. I don't know. But uh Gradually, the news will trickle out, and we'll know more very soon about that. Right. Okay. And also, news about the Gimme Some Truth compilation, which has made an impressive debut on the official album charts in the UK, entering at number three there. But there's also a physical chart where it's supposed to be number one. And Sean was uh, posting that on, uh, on social media. I don't know how you can look that up, but that's what Sean was saying. So it's great that it's doing well in the UK. On the Billboard charts uh, in America, in the top 200, it debuts at number 40. So let's hope that it climbs much higher than that. Okay. A new book is out called John Lennon 1980 Playlist by Tim English, which according to Amazon examines the music John was listening to during the year of his creative rebirth and how that music impacted his life. Reggae, new wave, blues, country, R&B, early rock and roll, ambient, and gospel. John listened to it all and loved it all. And uh, you learn, certainly from the interview that he, that he gave in Playboy, some of the uh, artists he was listening to on the radio at that time, like Bruce Springsteen and um, The Talking Heads, Blondie, The Cars, Donna Summer, Elton John, David Bowie. It's all covered in this book, which was released on paperback on September the 24th. And actually, Darren was the one who alerted me to this. Thank you, Darren. You keep me around for a reason, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> 
And there's another new book on John out, which is called Understanding John Lennon by Francis Kenny. Francis wrote to me saying that this is an original take on John Lennon's life, which has lots of new info about John and his life in Liverpool. The book will soon be available in Liverpool shops, but at the moment it's available on Amazon and other online booksellers. Ringo Starr is among the many superstars who will be honoring the great Jerry Lee Lewis with a virtual concert for Lewis's 85th birthday, which happens to be this day in which we're recording this on October the 27th. Ringo will join Keith Richards, John Fogarty, Chris Christopherson, Elton John, Joe Walsh, Willie Nelson, Priscilla Presley, Billy Gibbons, former President Bill Clinton, and others. And the concert will be on Lewis's own Facebook and YouTube pages at uh, 7 p.m. Central Time. We'll probably talk about this in our next show. The special's called Whole Lot of Celebrating Going On, 85 Years of the Killer. Okay, a few more things. Legendary musician Spencer Davis has died at the age of 81 while receiving treatment for pneumonia. He formed the Spencer Davis Group in 1963 with Davis on guitar, vocals, and harmonica, a young Stevie Winwood on organ and vocals, Muff Winwood on bass, and Peter York on drums. Davis actually came from South Wales and his band, Blended Folk, Blues, and Jazz. Their first UK hit, Keep On Running, went to number one, knocking out the Beatles' double A-sided hit, We Can Work It Out, and Day Tripper. But the Beatles, being good sports, actually sent Davis a congratulatory telegram. The Spencer Davis group went on to score the timeless classics of Gimme Some Lovin' and I'm a Man and Somebody Help Me. Davis is also in the Beatles film Magical Mystery Tour, where he is an uncredited bus passenger. Later on, he was in a super group called World Classic Rockers, along with Denny Lane in the group. And Randy Meisner from the Eagles was in there, as well as Bobby Kimball the original front man for Toto. Okay. We also suffered the loss of singer Tony Lewis from the British band, The Outfield. The band was best known for their top 10 hit, Your Love, in 1986. And the song has had a recent life being used in a TV commercial for Bounce Fabric Softener Dryer Sheets. So I'm sure you're asking, is there any connection between The Outfield and The Beatles? Well, there no, is No, actually, one. I was asking. I, I was going to ask, is there any, any connection between the Beatles and dryer sheets? Probably. Probably. We'll have to do more research on that, I think. Alan, do you know? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, I was Alan, wondering uh, the same thing myself. <laughs> <laughs> but the only connection that I know of so far is that uh, the group actually recorded a tribute song to John Lennon, which was called John Lennon. And you can find it on their album called Diamond Days, released in 1990. Tony Lewis was only 62. Finally, since I mentioned one connection between the Beatles and Eddie Van Halen in our last show, that being that George Harrison joined Eddie on stage at a tribute concert for the late drummer Jeff Porcaro in 1992, one of our listeners named Jeff Jones, not the Jeff Jones, but a different guy altogether, just wrote to me that during their 1998 tour, Van Halen did a medley of their song Without You, and We Can Work It Out, which you can find online on YouTube. But it's only at the very end of the song, and it's a very short part of We Can Work It Out, just the last half minute or so. So there you go. That's all the news for now. Okay. And so uh, questions, round robin, going around in circles. Uh, why don't we start uh, with Ken? Let's start peppering uh, Ashley Khan with some of our things we said today. Uh, questions. Well, actually, we should say that the reason why Ashley's on is because he has a new book out, which is called Harrison on Harrison. And it's basically made up of uh, lots of interviews that George did throughout his career, even from the Beatle days and even other things like speeches that he's given. And it's really a wonderful book. It goes all the way to the end of George's life. I've been loving reading this book, Ashley. And I just want to start by asking you the simple question of, you know, how you went about doing this, because 
this obviously doesn't have every single interview that George did. What was the process like in acquiring these interviews? Uh, did you try to get uh, several that he, you couldn't, you know, get the rights to? Or what was it all like from the very beginning to try to get all these interviews? And what kind of research did you have to do to know everything that George Harrison did as far as interviews are concerned? Are those enough questions? <laughs> yeah, you guys, you guys are killing me. <laughs> there's a, at least 20. I mean, if I parse that question, there's at least 27 things that you asked. <laughs> Uh, but I, and I don't mind. I mean, you know, it's it's I'm not complaining. There's you basically um, uh, kind of touched all the bases in one question there, Ken. And uh, I, I've got to say that, um, you know, the initial philosophy that I had, uh, the kind of uh, reason for jumping in this was basically to allow George to speak for himself, to be unfiltered and to try and get if I couldn't find uh, the original raw interview tapes, as I was able to do with, um, uh, it was a lot easier with more recent journalists and, and their, I mean, more recent interviews done by um, journalists who are still active rather than those back in the 60s. I at least tried to go back to um, the original TV broadcast or the radio broadcast or whatever to, um, uh, or transcripts from the interview in the case of Timothy White you know, I really wanted to kind of present the unfiltered George. And every interview has a little bit of framing text beforehand that uh, tries to set up that, uh, put, put the reader in the mind of, you know, where they were at that point in time when that journalist met George and what it was like. Sometimes I got, um, you know, a little bit of a, how I got that story email from from the journalist who was uh you know behind it but that was that was the driving force was to allow george's voice to speak for himself and to try and figure out you know what what he was like when he was you know just coming out of his teen years and establishing himself uh with the beatles all the way up to uh, the end of his life in 2001 you know and what consistent uh kind of threads we could find in there and um, and I believe you you really get a feel for who he is as a person and what it was like for him to uh, mature and evolve in such a public way, uh, you know, with the spotlight on him from the time he was, you know, barely 21, 22 years old. Right. As I'm going through this book, because I'm aware of other interviews that he's done that are not in it. That's kind of like how my mind works because, you know, we're going sure. chronologically through the book. Were there some that you tried to get where you weren't given permission or was everybody pretty easy to work with as far as getting the rights for uh, uh, the transcriptions? You know, I, I have to say to, to try and answer that question, it's, it's totally uh, the, the complete range from, you know, uh, pulling teeth to um, it couldn't have been easier you know, to, oh, it's public domain. So I, all I have to do is just uh, make sure that uh, it's properly dated and credited, you know, all the above. Um, a lot of it had to do with, um, you know, how to negotiate the fact that I'm dealing with a beetle here, you know, and a beetle who is uh, during uh, the 60s, part of a group of four that is still represented by four different interests under the uh, you know umbrella of Apple Corps, but then you know George has his own company called Harris Songs, and um, I made sure that they were aware this project was on the way, and um, you know in the end uh, I believe that I I jumped through the right hoops and got the right uh, permission uh, for a you know a, a kind of a bohemian budgeted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, effort here. But, you know, the idea was to collect George's words in a manner that really kind of reflected not only his own growth, but the growth of the world around him. And how you can see, even in the questions that uh, were being asked of him in 1965 versus 67 versus 69, mm. and then in through the 70s, how the world was really growing up fast coming out of the 60s and what we expected from music 
what we expected from our music stars and what they were able to deliver as far as you know, uh, commentary on on politics and commentary on the world in general, and the big questions, you know, which George was very much tackling from a very young age. Why are we here? You know, mm-hmm. what are we supposed to be doing? And he did not pull back from stuff like that. And in fact, he he helped, especially with you know albums like All Things Must Pass. He helped inject those questions into the notion of what's acceptable with a pop song. So, um, you know, these were all topics that I wanted to make sure in advance I was going to cover. I also wanted to make sure that I was going to cover um, uh, the fact that, you know, from from what my research told me, that if, if we think of the Beatles as having this mission, and that mission was kind of represented in, in their creating Apple Corps, you know, supporting uh, not only their own projects and their own music, but those of of a certain creative circle around them, that George was the uh, the one who carried this message and this mission uh, further than any of the other Beatles after the breakup of the band. Yeah, I want to just spotlight. Well, that there's there's quite a lot I'd like to ask you. Probably sure. won't get to all the questions, but some things that really uh, I was surprised to learn. And you you do notice the evolution of this man and how quickly he grew as a person. But even early on, there's an interview that Derek Taylor does with George Mm -hmm. while he was uh, in the Bahamas on the set of Help, and where George actually said that he prefers making films to touring. And um, his exact quote was, when the film is finished, you get more satisfaction from it. You feel as though you're doing something worthwhile, more so than a tour. And so we all knew that George soured on the Beatles touring. Certainly by 1966, he had had enough. But this is February of 65 already. <laughs> yeah. So he's, yeah. he's already made this comment about, was he already tired of touring at that point? Uh, you know, I think you got to even pull back further. And the big picture in 65, 66 is that uh, you, you can sort of see it in the Maureen Cleave uh, interview where um, which I believe is from 65 as well and he's just about to marry Patty and he has just bought his first house and the house keeps getting kind of vandalized and, and street signs are being torn down and uh, the, the the street number on the on the gate is is being torn torn away by fans that he's getting tired of that aspect of the the Beatles experience and you know the idea of and 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 he's even talking about politics in the UK at that time and you can hear him bristling talking about certain TV shows that he's been watching and I kept thinking about you know like nowadays when we go online and spend too much you know time on Facebook or whatever you know every period has its media you know rabbit hole to go right. down and every every uh you know young generation is like why the heck does it have to be this way why can't it be different and will you you know leave my mailbox alone please mm-hmm. i thank you for being a fan of the beatles but you know let's all grow up a little bit you know that's already there in 65 66 so by the time 67 hits and he starts, you know, touting uh, transcendental meditation, and he starts talking about Ravi Shankar and the influence of Indian music. You know, he, you can see that um, that spiritual door is about to just, you know, burst open for him, and he's going to be looking for answers, you know, in a different place than where um, there where he grew up. Yeah, in a way, I think he probably tired of the mania even before John did. Uh, absolutely. I would say that uh, George was the one who, you know, in the end, there was a reason why he was the quiet Beatle, you know, and that's because <laughs> he did a lot of thinking, you know. And when people did talk to him, hey, he, he was not quiet, but he did have, I think, a deeper, uh, more kind of, you know, I, I, I want to be able to talk about stuff other than just the usual, you know, pop music star kind of chat that that had, right. was, was prevalent at the day. And you can tell in some interviews when he's asked a question that he doesn't want to be asked or something that's superficial, 
you know, you can tell that you can, you just kind of know that in his mind, he's thinking this is BS, <laughs> you know, yeah. you can feel that, you know, but a, a couple of things before I pass you over to, uh, I guess, Alan, but um, on page 75, I found this one quote, it's only one sentence, really interesting. This is in Melody Maker, mm -hmm. and he was talking to Alan Walsh, mm -hmm. and regarding getting his material wealth, he said, all we ever had to do was be ourselves, and it all happened. And then to expand on that, there's uh, another interview in Melody Maker with Nick Jones, where you get the impression, and he got this from the Maharishi, apparently, that everything in life is predestined. Yeah. yeah. That um, all the routine that we go through in this life is an illusion. Reality is God alone. And there has to have been something in George's mind where such a simple statement, all we ever had to do is be ourselves, and it all happened. And it's not that simple. You know, you could be the most talented band in the world and not go anywhere. And... You know, if, if they hadn't met somebody like Brian Epstein, you know, or had the luck to have a George Martin to produce them, they may not have been as successful as they were. But yeah. did George really think, you know, that this was just going to happen anyway? Well, I mean, you know, I, I take him at his word here, and I don't see why we shouldn't. You know, he is basically saying that. You know, I mean, you said, yes, he was lucky to meet Brian Epstein, but, you know, to him, he, he would say, no, that was not luck. You know, that was there was a reason why that happened. We just don't know what the reasons are. There are no chance encounters. There's no circumstance here. It's it's kind of predestined, predetermined. And we're we have a role to play while we're here. And our role is to, you know, accept the script that is given to us and evolve accordingly and do with what's best. And I think the way that you see this play out, uh, especially in future interviews, is that he is never apologetic for either his fame nor his fortune. And he is someone, even though he professes, like when he's talking about handmade films or he's talking about uh, the, the uh, legal and business tussles that he'll go through uh, for, you know, uh, that long and winding, you know, uh, legal wrangling that, that followed the breakup of the Beatles, he is never apologetic about being a businessman, even though he, he kind of resists that, he stresses that he hates reading contracts and whatnot. But the idea of being uh, someone who has succeeded and been given, you know, this um, incredible, you know, uh, stroke of good fortune to be in one of the most important bands of all time, you know, he is accepting of that and wants to do what's best with that. But that sort of balance between pursuing a spiritual path and being a smart and effective businessman, he was absolutely fine with working out that balance. And he did not see that as being one against the other. Hmm. The only thing I'm confused about is that he believed in karma. And if karma is that, you know, whatever you get is from your own actions, it's be the reason why he had the success that he did is because of whatever moves he made in his life. But then it could have been in a previous saying, life, though. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I mean, do you, you know, the, the Vedic view works in 25,000 year cycles. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the karma is something that comes from previous life cycles that you've gone through according to you know the primary uh, spiritual belief that was part of what was a kind of hybrid a, a view of you know developed from his uh, explorations of eastern spirituality you know but the uh, that that vedic you know kind of perspective uh, I think is is one way of really understanding George even more, you know, that uh, this is something that develops again and again over time. Mm. It's fascinating. I don't know anybody else in music, certainly with that kind of profile, that, that really talked about spirituality to this degree and believed in it the way that George did. No, there's, you're absolutely right. There are very few who came out of that moment, you know, in the late 60s, when having a guru, having a swami, uh, pursuing a spiritual path was, kind, was 
both trendy and kind of it becomes entrenched in the Western world. And as to those who actually stuck with it and really have woven it into um, how they look at life and uh, have, you know, pursued their careers, there's only a few. And Carlos Santana is one, most definitely. Mm. And another was Alice Coltrane, you know. Um, and the third is, of course, George Harrison that I can think of. Yeah. Okay, Alan. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, Ken, Ken, actually, I mean, apart from having asked most of the questions that, you know, you can think of, there is, in, in terms of the process of putting this together, I think I can take one step back farther than, than Ken did, which is that, you know, I think of you mostly as a jazz guy. Um, and so I'm just curious how you gravitated towards George Harrison. Yeah. And, and like why a Beatles topic in the first place and then why George within that? Well, the first answer I think would be that both before and after being a jazz guy, I've been a music guy. Mm, okay. <laughs> you know? So long before I knew categories of, or was really adept at, uh, you know, uh, figuring out, oh, this music is from this time period and fits into this category. I just love music. I've, I've always loved music. And the Beatles, of course, were part of that initial uh, doorway that I went into understanding that there were songs and the songs had you know lyrics and uh, and there'd be these solo portions you know where you would hear one voice and other parts where you'd hear a bunch of voices together you know so and the beatles were just an incredible training ground i think for my generation and a little bit before my generation as well i'm a class of 1960 here so uh you know the Beatles were already breaking up when I was just becoming kind of culturally aware. Mm. Uh, but growing up in the 70s and being a teenager in the 70s, there was no band that was bigger or more uh, lauded or more celebrated than the Beatles were. And so, you know, uh, that sticks with you. You know, it's uh, same thing with like 1969 Mets. You know, they, you know, yeah. you, you you live and breathe and grow up with this kind of connection, yeah. you know, and and so for me, uh, the idea of doing a book like this on one of the Beatles, especially uh, a Beatle who uh, had so many different uh, lives and um, career paths going on, you know, uh, just I mean, it's one thing to say, oh, he got involved with films. Oh, he, he was he was enamored of the of Monty Python and the projects they were doing. No, Handmade Films was one of the biggest and most impacting, uh, impactful, I should say, you know, players in as far as British independent cinema went in in the nineteen eighties and nineties. Mm -hmm. You know, that's uh, next to Merchant Ivory. I can't think of a a, a production company that had more. Uh, that delivered more kind of groundbreaking films than handmade films. Right. And that's an important aspect here, too. So as an author, you know, you look for stories. As an author, you look for, you know, let me bring these things out of the shadows and put them all together. And so, you know, I was very much satisfied uh, both as a researcher and um, an editor in wanting to you know, bring all these different sides to George uh, of George's uh, career to light to mm -hmm. eat, you know, uh, for the sake of like, you know, a full and um, better understanding of his, uh, you know, impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, uh, you know, I've seen lots of com compilations of interviews, of course, but um, there's something about this volume that works I'd say better than most, um, and it may have something to do with the fact that each one is introduced and put in context. But I think it also has to do with the fact that George's evolution was so different than each of the others. I mean, they were each actually different from each other, but he yeah. went so many different places. I mean, I, I really was fascinated by um, a lot of his discussions of various aspects of Hinduism, you know, the, the Hare Krishna 
uh, people as, as a, a, let's say, a sect of, of a sort. Um, and his explanation of that and how it fit into other forms of Hinduism and, um, and his discussions of, you know, basically the nature of God, you know, I, I guess is, is how you would put it most reductively. But um, it, it's just, you know, it's something he's always been fascinating about, but having it between two covers and being able to sort of, you know, page through and see the evolution of those ideas. And, you know, as he gets to know people who influence him, uh, really was, uh, it, it really brought him to life, I think. I mean, you know, a lot, a lot of the time, especially with, you have so many QAs, which I think is, is what you particularly wanted when you, you say you wanted him unfiltered. But, you know, you, you sit there and you're reading it and you're, you're arguing with him, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, you see, that's that's the other thing that I think uh, remains consistent from his teen years all the way to when he passed, is that he is absolutely authentic and that his his faults, as well as, you know, that which, you know, draws us to him, his wonderful sense of service, you know, his wonderful open eyed uh, way of looking at uh, the music business with all its foibles and and also, you know, the very romantic notion of why he got involved with rock, uh, rock and roll, mm -hmm. you know, in the in the first place. All of that never changes. Yeah. You know, it, it's always there. And you can see that he's someone who's very in touch with himself, you know, that he. Uh, he has changed. He grows, you know, the way he talks about the Beatles, of course, absolutely is different from 1964 to 69 mm -hmm. to, to the 70s and 80s when he's so disgruntled and and uh, hard bitten and uh, can't talk about Paul without, you know, uh, mentioning, <laughs> you know, the latest, you know, uh, right. lawsuit twist or whatever, uh, or the fact that Paul didn't show up for the you know, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction, you know, he um, he is very true to form. He's true to who he, you know, what he's feeling at the moment. You know, I think that uh, speaking of that, you know, in 1988, when the Beatles were inducted, if you actually see the video of him talking, mm -hmm. you really get a sense of how hurt he was and how in pain he was, that John was not up there because, of course, he had been uh, killed in 1980. And uh, and that Paul had decided not to come, you know, yeah. and there's a lot of pain, which he was uh, allowing himself to express publicly. And I think that really comes through a lot of the interviews here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this idea. is. This is one of the interesting things about this, you know, he was reputedly the quiet one and he mentions many times in these interviews that he really doesn't like giving interviews. And yet he was great <laughs> at it. You know, these are really good <laughs> interviews, very revealing, you know, the, when, when he talks to the guy from Crawdaddy, uh, Gla Mitch Glazer. Mitch Glazer, um, yeah. Uh, you know, and the in and, and they're talking about Clapton and Patty and all that. And at one point he says, "Yeah, well, you know, I, I don't mind being personal. I brought it up, you know." And right. uh, and uh, so, had you developed any theories about why he was so uninterested in doing interviews and yet did them so well? I, I just think that it, it's like anything where, you know, it's like you know, if you have teeth problems, uh, dental issues, you got to go to the dentist, you know, mm -hmm. and if you're a beetle, uh, this is part of your role. This is, you know, I, I think that at a certain point, he also talks about the idea of Beetle George. He, he refers to uh, this role that he plays as Beetle George. Mm -hmm. And even after the Beatles you know, have, have, uh, after their dissolution, you know, he's, he, he knows that he has to go to the interviews and, you know, put on like other people put on a business suit or other people put on their, you know, duds to, to go work on a house or whatever. This is what he is here to do. And he's accepting of that. Mm -hmm. Of course he, he, you know, he, he hates the, um, you know, <laughs> there's a uh, uh, interview from 89 
uh, which was with MTV News. And the uh, MTV had just put together their news department in 88 with Kurt Loder and various other people. And a certain unnamed interviewer is interviewing uh, the Traveling Wilburys, Mark II. You Mm -hmm. know, this is after Roy Orbison has passed. Mm -hmm. And you can tell that this interview went south from the start. The interviewer did not have... Uh, their shit together, excuse my French, you know, uh, they did not do the necessary research, they didn't, um, and they weren't adept at dealing with uh, three guys who had just come back from what sounds like a liquid lunch. (laughs) (laughs) And George is the one being the responsible one, trying to give them the sound bites, the, uh, the, the answers that they can use and just to get the interview over with because it's so painfully done, you know. And George is the professional, you know. Yeah. Tom Petty and Jeff Lynne could have couldn't have cared less. Right. But George is the one who's taking care of business. So I think it's just that George has been down that road, you know, especially with the Beatles. You know, it's time to go make the donuts, you know, and that mm-hmm. includes putting on the face you know, responding to the most inane questions with something that at least sounds somewhat intelligent. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I mean, as, as I'm sure we've all interviewed people who don't like doing interviews and don't settle into the role at all. You know, it's just like you get out of there after half an hour or an hour and you think, I, I don't even know if there's anything here to use, you know, <laughs> whereas George, you know, he, he, he didn't want to do it, but you know, he seemed very friendly to the people interviewing. He seemed um, interested in answering their queries. And if they asked him the right questions, if they got on to, if they really actually did seem curious, about the religious stuff. He was like happy to, you know, explain it all, you know, it just sounds like, uh, you know, you get, you get really a picture. I was going to ask you why you did interviews rather than a biography, but in a certain way, this book sort of is a biography, you know, you, you read this, you, you know, the background story already yourself, but this kind of really puts it in a lot of perspective and shows you what's going on, you know, inside upstairs, while everything else is going on. Well, I think it speaks also to the fact that George was willing to, even in, you know, uh, a sort of, uh, you know, this is the, the, the 13th interview of the day and you're stuck inside of, uh, you know, an office at, at Warner Brothers in Burbank and it's night, early 80s or mid 80s or something. He turns every conversation into something of value. Not every artist does that, as you as you just pointed out. And so I want this kind of book treatment, I don't think would work with certain other artists. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't see I'm not sure it would work with, say, Lou Reed, unless, you know, he really, (laughs) you know, you know, unless you want to maybe for the comic value, you know, but, um, you know, and uh, and I love Lou and I loved his perspective on things. But, you know, he was definitely not one who uh, caught into the, uh, the whole role of, of uh, being the interviewee and right. waiting for the right question to, mm-hmm. to come its way. You know, you know, with with George, I think he he found his moments. And I was I just feel very, very fortunate that I was able to get a hold of. You know, like like I said, the original tapes or the original transcripts of certain interviews had really went deep into stories that he had not told yet Mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, the way that he was responding to immediate current events of the late 80s or early 90s or whenever the interview took place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I should pass you on to Darren now. Darren. Okay. (laughs) Your turn, Darren. Oh, Darren? Darren? Maybe Uh-oh. what I should do is uh, unmute my microphone. <laughs> uh, what I was saying was that I was enjoying the conversation. I was thinking, you know, maybe they won't throw it to me and I could enjoy the whole show, uh, which is pretty <laughs> fascinating here. Uh, and I like I love the fact, Ken, that you gave the page numbers to your questions. So I was able to uh, follow along and uh, <laughs> read with you. 
But Alan <laughs> did take sort of one of my questions, uh, which was the decision on your part, Ashley, to do this kind of book, whereas you were allowing George to do the uh, uh, to do the speaking in his own words, as opposed to writing a traditional biography. Right. Uh, was that from the very, very, very beginning your goal that you were going to approach the a George Harrison story doing it this way? Well, you know, this is part of a series that Chicago uh, Chicago Review Press has done called Musicians in Their Own Words. But now they kind of tack on the uh, subtitle Interviews and Encounters. So, it, you know, the, the, the general trope was already in place. How far to take that and how to how to, you know, build on that was my decision. And I decided, let's go all the way. You know, let's mm -hmm. let's have George speak for himself because George, you know, once again, for being called the quiet beetle, he definitely spoke a lot. And if I could find enough stuff and I certainly did, you know, I mean, it's over 500 page book and I'm very proud of every every every, uh, you know, every one of the 40 plus uh, interviews or encounters that are in there. Mm. Did you compile the book chronologically? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it kind of uh, demands that that happens. It was not going to divide with any sense of of uh, seamlessness, <laughs> you know, into um, subjects or topics, because in many interviews he's covering multiple topics, and in every interview, you know what topic he's covering too, you know. Mm -hmm. So. You know, how, how to, how, you know, this is actually one of the things, the challenges that I had for myself is how many times can we have George Harrison talking about the Beatles from uh, different, you know, time periods, etc. And I found that uh, refreshingly, you know, George has a fresh take on speaking about the Beatles every time he, he approached it. You know, I, I was, that was the, my big fear was that there was going to be a kind of repetitive feel to it. But I, uh, you know, when I, when I turned in the final manuscript, um, I stepped away for about a month and I came back to it because I had to like answer queries and go through, you know, fine, fine tooth, uh, copy edit, blah, blah, blah. But I found that as I read the whole book, I did not encounter that feeling. What I encountered was the idea that this is something that we all want to know about and that his perspective, of course, changes, evolves, uh, develops over time. And um, he always has something new to add. The funniest thing, I think, to me is, is when he gets to the point that he has a son and he has a son who he has to introduce uh, to the Beatles <laughs> at a certain point. <laughs> and and uh, uh, the story is that, you know, he goes to the Prince's Trust and he performs with uh, Eric Clapton, of course, and he does the tunes that he has to do. You know, here comes the sun while my guitar gently weeps, etc. And his, his son, you know, Danny, uh, sees him perform for the very first time. And... Uh, he goes, so what did you think? And he goes, well, I thought you were going to do Beatles songs. And he goes, I did do Beatles songs. <laughs> he goes, no, twist and shout, uh, you know, <laughs> roll over Beethoven, you know. So his son was still, you know, had hit his entry point with the Beatles and was still kind of learning, you know, but had fallen in love with the mop top period. <laughs> right. <laughs> As 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 you're going through the interviews and as the book is is unfolding and the story is unfolding, was it easy for you to you know were there any interviews um, that you stumbled upon where you saw that obvious um, uh, you know the maturity and the fact that you were uh, studying a subject here that was growing older? I think the first interview in the book, George was 19, right uh, when it was conducted. Now you're going through these these interviews chronologically as he grows up and from your perspective was it was it the maturity and obvious oh absolutely uh the way that he handles himself with john on one side and david frost on the other and he's trying to explain spirituality and and uh, transcendental med meditation to to a tv audience 
you know, in 1966, you know, or 67, I think it was 67. You know, he handles himself so well. And he is that buffer between, you know, John's, you know, very, you know, caustic comments. And then, uh, you know, uh, David Frost trying to be Mr. TV commentator, funny and yet deep at the same time, you know. And he's, he's playing, playing the straight guy and he does it really well. And he gets some points across in these two TV shows that uh, you wouldn't expect him to do. And he then, does, he does like, it a lot better than Dick Cavett, too. <laughs> that, I love that too, you know, and that that's another thing that's where you can read it on paper and then compare it to like, a, a, you know, the stuff that's on YouTube and it holds up really well. It matches really well. In other words, that uh, the emotional content as well as the uh, the wit and the, the depth of what he says uh, transferred to, to a written form very well. I was happy about that. Mm-hmm. You mentioned uh, la- uh, later on George being disgruntled. When did you begin to detect that uh, any anger or unhappiness was beginning to uh, uh, become prominent uh, in George's mind? Uh, and uh, was he always open about what at any given time was uh, not sitting well with him? Uh, the latter. I think, you know, that's the point I'm trying to make here is that the authenticity that really comes through in this book from the very beginning is that he's very true and open with his feelings, but he doesn't just, you know, throw out, uh, I mean, like, you know, with with John, you would expect him to, you know, have some sort of um, barb, (laughs) you know, or or a bit of sarcasm where you don't really know where it's coming from. George takes the time to express why he's so pissed off at British politics or at uh, Paul and the whole sort of, you know, dismantling of of Apple, you know, in the 70s and 80s or the way that governments are dealing with the environment uh, when he's talking with um, uh, Mark Rowland, you know, who was co-editor of Musician Magazine, et cetera, et cetera. It's always there. It's just that, you know, he learns how to speak about this stuff in a more balanced and informative way, as as we all do. But he is always true to himself. So I, I don't see that as like a, there's a certain line he crosses. And then from then on, you know, that becomes part of his makeup. I think it's always there. Last uh, two weeks ago, our last show, we interviewed uh, Ken Womack on his recent book on John Lennon. We talked about at the time of John's death that the relationship between John and George was not was not in a, in a good place. And did anything on your end, did you reveal any of uh, of any issues that George may have had with John as the 70s wore on and maybe before his death or any um, uh, conversations with that you heard with George after 1980, where he maybe expressed something that he wasn't happy about with John or you know, his, his thoughts on John, the person. No, not really. I mean, he's much more public and open about his, um, uh, disappointment with, with Paul, but of course, you know, uh, you know, it's like, like any marriage that falls apart, you know, you, you can't deny the, the, the great moments that you had together. Uh, it was Paul who, who brought him into the group. Um, it was Paul and John who, helped get him over to Germany, you know, and uh, I mean, I can't imagine how uh, life changing them must have been for a teenager to suddenly be on your own and to, to, to go through that whole Hamburg experience. And I'm sure there was this uh, tight, you know, uh, lifetime connection that would, would never be severed. You know, it's just that there's disappointment. But speaking to George and John, I think that um, that they're actually very parallel in the fact that um, they both have, you know, these life partners that they've gotten with and that they start to develop a family. And in the late 70s, they really uh, mid to late 70s, they really focus on that. Maybe George is like one or two steps behind. But, you know, John had. Yoko and then Sean and focused on his life, you know, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. 
George had Olivia and they had Danny together and he focused on their life together at Friar Park for a number of years. And so unfortunately, John's getting shot and killed uh, takes place while he's still sort of in that, you know, semi-retirement, if you will, you know, in Surrey, you know, outside of uh, London. Mm-hmm. Any, um, any, could you, could you pick out one or two wow moments that you may have had something you didn't expect to discover, uh, that, uh, really knocked you out when you were reading and like this, you know, I didn't expect to hear something (laughs) like this, or I didn't expect, you know, the conversation to go down that road. What was a wow moment or two that for you? Well, you know, the, the radio, uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, it, it sounds like uh, uh, this was like a midweek radio program that BBC was doing in 1979, a kind of jukes, jukebox jury thing. And it's George coming up from Friar Park and Michael Jackson happens to be in town. He's touring with the Jacksons still, uh, but just starting to work on, on Off the Wall. And you realize that, oh, my God, here are, you know, two just arbitrarily, these two incredible artists are on this kind of throwaway radio show together for about two hours, you know, and they're listening to music of the day, Nicolette Larson and Eddie Money (laughs) and going like, it's okay, it's all right, you know, I'll, I'll give it, I'll give it four stars, you know, but the interaction between George and Michael is absolutely hilarious you know like when when the radio host asks uh george um about some of the music that he wrote uh he mentions something (laughs) and michael goes hey i thought that was led in mccartney (laughs) (laughs) so did frank sinatra (laughs) yeah and Mm. george george responds oh yeah everybody does (laughs) you know and and it goes on from there and then you realize where, where George was exactly 10 years before, in 1969, the kind of, you know, chafing at the bit because he can't get his band to respect his songwriting prowess and developing uh, compositional, you know, skills is exactly where Michael is in 1979 in the Jacksons. And the reason why he will go go solo um and do you know off the wall is because he can't get his brothers to do uh some of the music that that he's in the middle of writing you know and so they have a lot more in common than anyone really realizes at that moment Mm -hmm. and you know and then you hear michael speaking about uh the whiz and it's some of the more intelligent and very uh Afrocentric, you know, speaking about black identity, et cetera, you know, um, the power of that production and how proud he was to be, you know, Scarecrow in it and working with Quincy, et cetera. And so you, you get the seed of what is about to come in the early 80s with Thriller, et cetera. Hmm. Uh, did you have any uh, contact with uh, Olivia and Danny during the process of putting the book together? Not while I was putting the book together, but, you know, in the end, I was told what I could and could not use. Um, I was told uh, that uh, they had read the introduction. And, you know, in the introduction, I was uh, very clear about Olivia's role in both guiding and saving George's life, especially when it came down to that, you know, intrusion in 1999 uh, around Christmas season when they, um, when he was stabbed. Mm-hmm. Know. In fact, you even say in the book 40 times. Yeah. I think there were 40, 40, um, wow. stabs. Yeah. It's a miracle. He lived. A- exactly. You know, and, <laughs> uh, you know, with a collapsed lung and everything, but this guy was out of his mind and I, you know, he was getting whacked on the head by Olivia with a piece of a broken statue and it didn't stop him you know, um, but eventually it did, you know, and Olivia literally saved his life. Mm -hmm. When that, when that happened, I remember thinking that that's the absolute worst possible thing that could have happened to George after the death of uh, John, knowing that 
you know, his privacy was so important to him and to George and, uh, you know, his safety was so important. What seemed to be an impenetrable home he was in gets broken into in the most horrific fashion. And yeah. he written a, 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 wor- a worse horror story than than what what that night must have been like. Yeah. And to have George and someone like George. Well, the, the sort of positive, um, it wasn't a press release as much as a uh, Christmas statement. Uh, Christmas um, kind of like, we're okay. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for, you know, thinking of us as, as we deal with this difficult moment. But in January of, of 2000, um, you know, they sent out this card. That's in the book, too. I was very happy that I was able mm-hmm. to include that. What I what I was not what what they you know there's always that you know uh, question you know film film directors get it like what what hit the editing room floor that mm-hmm. you know and last and uh, there was one letter that George wrote in 1961 uh, to uh, Stuart Sutcliffe. And he mentions you know that we need you back in the band and of course Stuart's still in Hamburg. The rest of the band has been, because they didn't have work permits, they had to get hustle back to uh, Liverpool, you know. So they don't have their bass player anymore. They don't have their good-looking bass player. It was kind of the star of the group. And um, he's trying to get him to come back with Aster, you know, um, his his new German girlfriend, to back to Liverpool to join the band. And the band's doing really well, and the cavern's going well. And Paul really doesn't play bass too good, you know. <laughs> and I thought, what a great letter to open with. <laughs> so who stopped you, Olivia or Apple? I believe that um, there is a one of those, um, what's the publisher? Genesis, you know, those oh, Genesis books. Right. Uh, there's, a, as there was one with Ringo and all of his letters and photos, taken while he was and the postcards he sent right. well right. i think there's a, a george uh, letters book that is in the process now okay. I, I don't know anything more beyond that but you'll notice there are no letters in the in the uh, george harrison on george harrison book. Mm-hmm. we're closing in on an hour with ashley so i thought you know i just asked a bunch of questions any closing thoughts from ken and from you alan uh, closing thought is I'm going to need several hours with Ashley. <laughs> I got so many questions here and, and I'd, I'd love to hear his responses to certain quotes from George, but, um, I want to only because of the fact that you brought up, oh, wow moments there, Darren, there's one in particular. I know that there are a lot of fans who have always had difficulty understanding this thing about George not minding that Patty went to Eric Clapton and that, you know, a lot of people thought that Eric stole George's girlfriend away. And, you know, George even said in that interview that the marriage is falling apart anyway and better to have her with his best friend, that kind of sentiment. But there's something in the book about Alan Klein in talking about the portrayal of Alan in the Ruddles as Ron Klein. And George said, this is a quote from him, even Alan Klein, because uh, he, he apparently, you know, liked that portrayal. George said, even Alan Klein thought it was just like him. One thing you could say about Klein is that he's got a good side, too. Even though we've sued each other for years, I still like the man. I have a problem <laughs> with that. <laughs> this That's is someone that knew all about the my street lord problems he goes and buys the music publishing and turns around and sues him how could he even say i still like the man yeah <laughs> i i do not have an answer for that except to say that um you know i once wrote an article for mojo on the whole uh, uh roots issue you know with john lennon suing morris levy and morris levy suing him for using uh lines from you know, a Chuck Berry tune within uh, uh, Come Together, et cetera, et cetera, and how they settled and what what was behind that whole thing. And in I had did was able to do an email interview with um, Yoko and asked her about this particular. Are you familiar with this? Sure. With, uh, OK, um, I, I thought I was with the right gang here. As mm-hmm. <laughs> um, 
But, you know, Yoko's response was that even with the lawsuit and uh, John, you know, eventually, uh, you know, uh, being victorious in, the, in that uh, legal, you know, battle, he respected Morris and he respected Levy's uh, creating, you know, Adamate Records and uh, KTEL and looking to try and find other ways of dis- distributing distributing music and the, the TV ads and whatnot, because no other labels were doing that, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think there was this idea that Alan Klein represented a, a certain way of looking at the music business with uh, a certain vision, uh, representation of artists' interests, et cetera, that he could respect. The fact that he ended up on the wrong end of the gun, <laughs> so mm. to speak, you know, no, he was not happy about that. And, you know, that that line, famous line in Beware of Darkness, you know, he says, beware of Abco, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, you know, so but George, you know, he if any of the Beatles was sophisticated enough to see that everything has a positive and a negative side, uh, George would be the person most definitely to have that level of sophistication, you know. And like I said, he was very uh, open-eyed about the the role of business and, you know, uh, that he was saddled with doing, but that he took to. And um, if anything, I think that his uh, breakup with, um, now I'm going to block his name, the guy he he was uh, managed by for a while. Dennis O'Dell? Dennis O'Brien. Dennis O'Brien. Dennis oh, O'Brien, sorry. Yeah. yeah, Dennis O'Dell is character. Um, but Dennis O'Brien, you know, who helped him found uh, handmade uh, films and was behind the fiasco of Shanghai Surprise, etc. You know, that's who he really had issues with towards the end of his career. And there was a, a long lawsuit uh, that went into the 90s with, uh, uh, that came on the tail end of the breakup of handmade films. I'll just ask one last question since you brought up Dennis O'Brien. I've always heard stories, and you don't know how true they are, that George, because of how Handmaid ended, that he was bankrupt. And part of the reason why he was involved with the Beatles anthology was to make money from it. So he, (laughs) you know, I mean, I don't know how true all this is. You know, there's so many stories that go around. It's hard for me to imagine that he would ever be broke. You know, considering the success that he had in his solo career and with the Beatle records and everything else. But sometimes when I look at the Beatles anthology, especially when the three of them are together at the end, he doesn't look like he wants to be there at times. Yeah, you know, I've I've been asked this question before. I think this is the third time this has come up. (laughs) (laughs) And I don't mind. And and, and I, I see this as a very worthwhile kind of uh, doorway to go through because uh, I've one, I, I, you know, George being who he was, I'm sure he separated his uh, fi- personal finances from all these speculative projects he got involved with in the eighties and nineties. I mean, that's the smart thing you do as a businessman. You don't put in your own money you know, and he certainly had the name and the reputation to attract uh, partners and investors, etc. And I'm sure he did, you know. So it was more his reputation rather than his personal, you know, finances on the line. I mean, I, I can't see him, you know, uh, needing to do anything radical. I do know, however, that he, he mortgaged Fire Park uh, as a means of getting a life of Brian the needed funding to, uh, you know, to come in and be the white knight. But with the success of Life of Brian, that's what led to the creation of, of handmade films, was that, you know, how did Eric Idol put it, the most expensive movie ticket ever, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But I think that also with the anthology series, I'm not quite sure where where it comes from that he looks like he doesn't want to be there because in a lot of the interviews that you see in this book, he's much more pissed off in the late 80s that he can't get involved 
with uh, or participate in getting uh, Beatles music out because they haven't settled yet the the whole, um, you know, how to proceed forward. And when in 89, uh, no, yeah, 89, uh, when the agreement is finally reached, I think that everyone, you know, all four of them were breathing a sigh of relief and they finally had control over how the Beatles would be packaged, uh, how the greatest hits and other stuff that was, you know, uh, uh, lying for years in the uh, archives, you know, could be uh, brought to light. He talks about his absolute disappointment with the, uh, kind of block the name, the uh, kind of documentary series that the, I think the BBC or ITV had done. In, the Complete Beatles? The Complete Beatles, thank you. Yeah. He hated that. Mm. And he talked about that as like, you know, if we were involved with that, we'd know how to present it. He thought the Ruddles were more accurate than Complete Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, assumptions that go around, but that he was a willing participant in, um, you know, any Beatles archaeological <laughs> you know, kind of effort. Well, I'm glad to know I'm not the only one that kind of sensed this about George. I know that when, when they were uh, gathering around the table and they were reminiscing about certain things, like meeting Elvis, he seemed to enjoy himself very much. I think when they were jamming together, you didn't see him smile. You know, it's just, I don't know. I got the impression he kind of didn't want to be there. There's also, Ken, there's also the, the talk of that third song that they were doing and that it was George that pulled the plug on those sessions. Mm -hmm. and the completing of the third song following Free as a Bird and Real Love. And maybe some folks take that as being George had his, had his fill of the whole project and and that was that. There was you also know, the I'm... soup fight. <laughs> this was the didn't soup. take place on camera, but you see a little bit of it when in the uh, promo clip for I think I think it's Real Love, where they drive up in George's fancy sports car, and they all get out, and you see George with a tank of something which he puts inside his coat. Apparently. George and Paul had a debate about who made better soup. <laughs> <laughs> and that was George's suit going into his coat. <laughs> where, my, where my mind went when I saw that was, why is George hiding a six pack of beer under his jacket? Don't you? I would, uh, because that's what I thought it was. <laughs> Well, you know, speaking of details, you know, and that period uh, that, you know, there's that moment in Free as a Bird, uh, the music video. Mm -hmm. Right. At the very end of it. And this this is another reason why I think George was a willing participant in all of this. There's a um, you see uh, it looks like the Beatles are getting ready to go backstage and it's black and white suddenly uh, uh, again, and you get the view of the stage from backstage, and there's a gentleman on stage by himself in a long shabby coat, and it looks like he's playing a ukulele. Mm -hmm. And that is an absolute tip of the hat to George's love of, of um, uh, this character who was sort of like the Charlie Chaplin of British cinema and British theater for many years named George Fromney. Right. Fromby? Fromby. 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 Right. And, uh, you know, his, and, and of course, George's love of, of the ukulele itself, you know, in, in the latter part of his career is well known uh, with Mark Seliger photographs, etc. But, you know, that uh, George Fromby, that's it. Yeah. And, you know, the reason why he's on stage and, you know, playing this little ukulele is because of George. So, you know, George had these moments where you can see his imprint. You can see his signature there. There's and, a little, uh, little more to it than that, actually. George wanted to be the guy on the stage. And they said, no, no, we don't want any current Beatles in the video. And then they found out later that George actually had played that ukulele part on the recording and they said oh you know i mean if we 
we knew you played it. We could have put you in the shabby coat and put you up there, but but he hadn't mentioned that part to them. Oh, I see. Well, you know, we we, we sort of get what you know take from from these details what we need sometimes to buttress our view. And, you know, uh, I got to say that, uh, you know, looking at over all of these interviews after a two and a half, three year process, what I come come out with is a guy who dealt uh, with, you know, the, 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 the pressures as well as the, the joys and the troubles and the, the pain and, and whatnot of being a Beatle, of being in the spotlight from the time he was barely in his 20s with such grace and with such sense of purpose, confidence, that, you know, in the end, it's why I say in the introduction, this is a life well led, you know, and that's, that's what you walk away with, that this is a, an example of how to live your life here on the planet and to, you know, learn and be inspired by what George did. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Now, I was just going to say there was this time period, I, I believe, when in England, the idea of having an American manager, you know, uh, who was uh, your own private pit bull, you know, was something that uh, I think a lot of rock uh, stars looked at as a kind of, you know, this now I've, I've reached this level of achievement, you know, I've accomplished, you know, so much that now I have an American manager and he's a bigger cunt than, you know, your American manager, <laughs> you know. But as we have seen, you know, uh, you know, if David Bowie could go back and get and, and unsign his, uh, you know, contract with uh, Tony, uh, blocking his name now, uh, Music Man uh, Enterprises. Um, I know who you mean. I can't think of the Tony, name either. Tony, Tony DeFries, mm. you know. And there was Alan Klein and there was, you know, of course, you know, Albert Grossman. But, um, you know, that was more by reputation than rather than getting involved. But, you know, even uh, Peter, uh, uh, you know, Led Zeppelin's manager, Peter Grant, Peter Grant, yeah. Peter Grant you know, that this idea of of having a, that you needed someone with, you know, that that kind of uh, temperament and larger than life, you know, gone were the days of the gentleman managers of Brian Epstein and whatnot. And I think that for a little while, for six, seven, eight year period, the idea of of getting managers of that ilk was something that was just done and and looked for. And then, of course, they got smart. (laughs) Yeah, it was playing with fire. Exactly. You know, also, kind of like what what Spinal Tap had with Ian Faith, who always had a crystal bat with him. Um, right. <laughs> always want to have a manager with a cricket bat. Um, I I want to ask one uh, one random question. Um, I was recently talking about this on WFUV as we approach the 50th anniversary of uh, All Things Must Pass and uh, of My Sweet Lord um, mm-hmm. coming out as George's first single and his first post Beatles album that uh, Billy Preston, actually his version of, of uh, my sweet Lord was released first by a matter of weeks was on Billy's encouraging words album. Uh, I had read the George, there was a bit of hesitation on George's part of revealing too much spirituality in his music, at least in 1970, as he was putting together all things must pass. And maybe uh, Billy Preston here, with, you know, his gospel background would be better suited for my sweet Lord. Did you see any hesitation where George felt maybe I, I shouldn't inject so much of the spirituality thing into uh, my music? I, I don't think that's true at all. I mean, he had already proven his uh, proven the uh, you know commercial potential, shall we say, uh, with with the uh, single that he had helped release on Apple uh, with the Harry Krishnas, you know. Mm-hmm. And that that preceded yeah. that. So, you know, yeah. if you think about it, you know, uh, the spiritual numbers that are on all, all Things Must Pass are a lot tamer and a lot more, you know, uh, accessible than uh, what what he had managed to accomplish with the Harry Krishna singers. Mm-hmm. Any other thoughts uh, before we let Ashley 
go off and have a drink of water. Escape. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I'll do yeah. the hairy lime and I'll, I'll, I'll go down into the sewer. <laughs> uh, Ashley, once again, it was a, a pleasure getting to talk with you. Yeah, uh, you absolutely. know, I saw that you were doing a book on George. Uh, I was thrilled from having admired, as I sounded like a fan at the beginning of the show, rattling off all of the books you've written. I'm such a fan myself personally of of uh, the Coltrane book, the, of course, the Impulse Records book and the Miles Davis kind of blue book, which are like Bibles to me. And needless to say, Carlos Santana, uh, who was an artist that desperately needed to have something in print. Uh, and now George Harrison. It was a thrill reading this book and getting to talk to you once again. And uh, I want to thank you for taking the time, well over an hour of your time to talk with us here on Things We Said Today. Hey guys, Darren, Alan, Ken, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, we did It was too. great having you on. Thanks for yeah. coming. Thank you, Ashley. Ashley Khan, the book is George Harrison on George Harrison, Interviews and Encounters. And it's published by Chicago Review Press. All right. Uh, great to be talking with Ashley Khan on today's show. Uh, time for us to put a wrap on things. So uh, I'll throw it over to Ken Michaels to pass on uh, his contact information and other relevant data. Okay. First of all, if you'd like to contact me directly, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com, and I want to alert everyone to the fact that I've been doing more special contests on the website. In fact, there's one right now where you can win three Beatle books, but that's about to wrap up this week. But coming very soon, there'll be another special contest to win three Beatle books all in one shot. So uh, the link for that will be on my homepage at kenmichaelsradio.com. And don't forget, there's a Beatles trivia and games page where you can win one of 10 prizes every single week. I have my other uh, podcast show called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, which happens just like this show, bi-weekly. Only ours is Monday nights at 9 p.m. That's Eastern time. It's a live broadcast on Facebook on our Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. You can join me with Kid O'Toole, uh, Tom Hunyadi from the Two Legs podcast, and also Joe Mayo, and occasionally Ken Womack. And our next show, which will be this Monday, which is November the 2nd, will be our review of the Give Me Some Truth compilation. And after the live broadcast, it'll also be on our Facebook page. It'll stay there, and you can also find it on YouTube and lots of other outlets, the audio portion of that. And uh, also, just in case you don't know, I just started my own YouTube page called Ken Michaels Radio. And a few weeks ago, I interviewed Joey Molland of Badfinger. He has a brand new album out called Be True to Yourself. So we talked a lot about the new album, which has Mark Hudson producing it uh, and co-writing songs with Joey. Uh, Julian Lennon does backing vocals on some of the songs, as does Mickey Dolenz. And we talk about the album and his days in Badfinger and some Beatle talk as well. So if you can, please subscribe to uh, those YouTube channels, Ken Michaels Radio, and for Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. I think that covers everything. Question for you, Ken. I yeah. still haven't heard Joe's album yeah. in, in, in 100 words or less. Your thoughts on Joey's album? It's very good. It's very commercial. It definitely has a Mark Hudson sound to it. There are certain songs that I feel like this could have fit on a Ringo album. <laughs> but uh, they're very well constructed, very commercial, very catchy, a lot of variety on it. The title track, I think, is like a musical, <laughs> which is the last track on the album. I think you'll enjoy it. But there's no doubt about it. Once you get used to Mark Hudson's style of production, once you hear the album, you know that it's a Mark Hudson production. But at the same right. time, he's such a craftsman at what he does. He's such a skilled songwriter, and he has it instilled in him. He's very commercial. He knows what's catchy. He knows how songs flow. He connects verses and choruses like nobody else. He has that in mind, and he brought that to Joey's songs. They're very commercial sounding, much more so than a lot of his other stuff. And that's not to say that Joey's music with Bad Finger and his solo music hasn't been commercial. A lot of it is quite commercial. I think maybe uh, 
maybe um, this is a bit more polished in sound, more slick, if you if you consider what he did with Ringo to be slick, and the stuff that he did with Bad Finger and on his own was is a bit more raw, you know, right. more pure that kind of sound. But um, no, it's definitely a very solid album from start to finish. Every song I really enjoy. Great lead guitar. One of these, Joey. Yeah. One of these centuries, I'll get one, a copy. <laughs> Um, and over to Alan Cozen. Alan, uh, where can folks find you shopping for food during the day? <laughs> well, if they want to find me through email or you know Facebook, uh, probably that'd be the easiest way. Facebook, I have two pages. One is Alan Cozen. One is Alan Cozen Remixed. There is also the group page, which is Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans on Facebook and also just plain things we said today on Facebook. Um, for some reason, we seem to prefer the things we said today, Beatles radio fans, but um, when I post the shows there, they also go on to things we said today page. Um, you can follow us on Twitter, at things we said fab, and you can email all of us at Ray, single Germanic word, Things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. Actually, it didn't seem as long this time. Things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And last but not least, don't forget to vote. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Alan. And uh, you can reach me. If you want to send me an email, you can email me at WFUV, Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. Over at Facebook, where I practically live, I've got two pages uh, trying to, again, I keep saying this, trying to keep the two pages unique to one another, which is kind of tricky. Darren DeVivo, or uh, you can even like Darren DeVivo, WFUV DJ, Beatles podcaster, writer. That page is there as well. Like that one or go to my personal page. Send me a friend request. Do not be insulted if I ask how you know me because I like to get a feel for who is on board uh, on my pages since, you know, you might listen to the podcast, you might listen to WFUV or both, or you just thought I was cute and you do wanted to friend me. So uh, uh, <laughs> don't be offended if I ask you how uh, you know me, and we'll proceed from there. Uh, and you can hear me at WFUV Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights. Probably would have been a lot easier to say Monday through Thursday nights from 10 p.m., Till midnight, hopefully getting back to 2 a.m. soon, one of these days. Saturday afternoon, you can hear me. Uh, 1 to 4 o'clock, WFUV is at 90.7 FM. If uh, you're still an HD person, 90.7 FM HD 2. You can stream us anywhere, WFUV.org. Listen on our app. And, uh, and now we, uh, as we now say, if you have a smart speaker, you can ask it to play WFUV. And with that, brings to a close another edition of Things We Said Today. For my pals, Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen, I'm Darren DeVivo. I want to thank you for listening. We'll see you on the next show in a couple of weeks.